Um, I suppose the questions that we need to ask are, uh, what do I have? Who do I leave it to? How do I leave it to them? How, who manages the process? And one that's becoming increasingly important is, what if I falter first? Um, so let's start. What do I have? We live in a very complex world where we're driven by tax imperatives. So we hold assets in different forms because our accountants told us we should. Um, and in a colloquial sense, we can't distinguish between what we own and what we control. So uh, some examples are insurance policies, trusts and superannuation. And of course, there's the way we own property. Do we own, do we own property as joint tenants? Do we own it as tenants in common? And uh, what I've learned, particularly over the last 10 years or so, is that too many people prepare a will at what I call a high level. I want everything to go to my partner and if my partner's not alive, I want everything to go to my children. Now, that's become more complicated because you now bring into account issues in relation to Centrelink and if I manage my assets better, would I improve my entitlement or my partner's entitlement to Centrelink or my entitlement to Centrelink if my partner goes first? Um, and, and then over the last 40 years or so, trusts have been a very important part of the business management structure for lots of people who are, uh, operate their own businesses. And in those particular models, the control of the trust doesn't, isn't governed by the terms of your will unless you amend the trustee to say it will. So let's run th through a couple of them. Uh, insurance policies. It might be a policy on your, on your life, but upon your death, who does it go to? Uh, who has the beneficial interest in the policy? Now, quite often it's a spouse. Every now and then you come across family law situations where it's the ex-spouse. You've already done a property settlement uh, and your second partner finds that the superannuation policy, the life policy that you've been paying has another nominated beneficiary. Now, I've seen some very generous first partners who are actually prepared to hand over the proceeds of the super policy, of the of the life insurance, but ones that weren't. So one of the pitfalls that you need to do is look, if you have an insurance policy, who's the beneficiary? It might be your will, it might be your children, but it's important for you to make sure that you get the ownership of the policy worked out uh, if you're going to deal with it as part of your estate planning. Trusts, um, the, the biggest issue, there are two issues with trusts. Uh, the first issue is that if you've got a loan account with a family trust, the loan account is an asset which is dealt with under the terms of your will. Um, and then there's a role in, in most trusts called an appointor, and a appointor is the person whose real job is to change the trustee. So it's the ultimate sanction. I can sack the trustee and I can put in place a trustee that I control. Now, um, I've had a number of discussions with senior counsel or QCs in the area and they all tell me that if uh, someone gets control of the trust as the appointor, say, say Fred is appointed as your executor and under the terms of the trust deed, your executor becomes your, um, your appointor, the Fred is not bound by the terms of your will in determining how he exercises his role under the trust. Now, um, I acted on the estate of a winemaker. We did a high level will. He wanted most of his estate to go to a college in Oxford. Unfortunately, he was running a series of, and we did a high level will. We, had to, we made provisions for employees, we did a few bits and pieces. And what then did was we decided that the rest of it would go to, uh, some of it went to Oxford and some of it went to a university in New Zealand, which is where he had developed his professional reputation. Um, unfortunately, while the whole kit and caboodle was worth about $15 million, he was worth two. Um, and it was all wrapped up in the trust. He chose the right person to be his executor because the executor was then able at a certain time to feed the assets of the trust back through the estate so the ultimate beneficiary obtained what was required. Um, 
the executor happened to be a beneficiary under the terms of the trust. So the, the executor could, had he felt so inclined, have taken $13 million and thumbed up, thumb, you know, uh, said to the, to the university in Oxford, I'm terribly sorry, but you can't have any money. I'm not going to give it there. So if you've got a trust structure, you need to look at control of the trust after you die. You need to make sure what you're doing in relation to the, um, uh, the, the, your loan account. Uh, I must say, in this particular case, the amount that went to the university worked out at about $12 million. And it was the largest bequest they'd had since the 1700s. <laughs> All right? So um, if, you, if you go to the universities in Oxford, now you know why the buildings are so old. That's when their building program's finished. <laughs> All right? Um, so, uh, and I had, uh, was involved in another estate where the uh, executor was, when we're talking about the trust situation, where we had a gentleman who had three sons. He had, his assets were two blocks of flats that were held in a family trust. And what he did was he left his estate equally to his three children and he left control and he left control of the trust to two of them. All right. Uh, not to the executors of the will, but outside the will. So upon my death, I appoint children B and C to be the appointors of the trust. So they took over when he died and they said to us, I'm terribly sorry, there's no money for A. We're not going to get a grant of probate. We're not going to do anything at all. You can go whistle. Dad never wanted you to have a cracker. Unfortunately, Dad got not quite good enough planning advice because... If I'd been acting for Dad, I would have fixed the problem. Um, what, what happened was, was that he had a loan account with a trust of a million dollars. The, the two blocks of flats were unencumbered and all up were worth about four million, but there was a loan account that he had with a trust of a million dollars. That was the estate. So we were able to get uh, for the adult son, who these days wouldn't get a cracker if, if the changes in the law go through, we were able to, to uh, make a claim on the estate <coughs> for some degree of uh, parity and we were able to get an interest on, in the million dollars. So uh, if he'd gone the next step and cleaned up his loan account, we would have had nowhere to go. He didn't. But the point is, is that control of the trust <coughs> isn't dealt with by the terms of your will. So, I mean, that's an important issue. Superannuation. Um, superannuation, we've all... Tw we've if you've got a superannuation policy, you have the choice of leaving your superannuation to your estate or to nominated beneficiaries, or if you want to leave it to what the law calls dependents, you can complete what's called a binding death nomination and it's binding on the trustees of your super fund and the estate must go to the people that you nominate if they're dependents. Now, um, Stepchildren are not dependents. Right? The definition of a dependent from a superannuation perspective is your partner and your children. The moment you're dead, then... And stepchildren include stepchildren. But the law says that the moment you die, the marriage is the link, the marriage has come to an end. As at the instant you die, they stop being your children. So it, I think... I quite frankly think it's something that ought to be looked at, but the legislation as it stands now says that you can't... If you make a binding death nomination in favour of stepchildren, it just doesn't work. Um, so I would be... You know, if you're doing that, think it through. The way that you would get around it is that you would arrange for the superannuation to go to your estate and you would sp put specific provisions in your will that would require the superannuation proceeds to be dealt with in a particular way. Um, that, that overcomes that problem. Uh, and apart from that, there isn't a way around it. So um, can I suggest if you've got binding death nominations and you want to benefit stepchildren, that's what I'd be looking at. David. Yes? If you don't nominate some for your superannuation, if you just don't nominate anything, yep. does it go to your estate by default? No. Um, if you don't nominate a beneficiary in any form, then it's up to the trustee of your superannuation fund and the superannuation fund has the ability to give it to your estate. 
and has the ability to give it to your dependents. Now, I, I didn't quite play fair on the definition of dependents before. Dependent is partner, dependent is children, and dependent includes anyone who is actually dependent on you. Um, that could be a uh, uh, could be a you know a girlfriend. It could be anyone at all. Um, but when you look at that, dependent means having regard to the basic necessities of life. So it's food, health, clothing, um, uh, and housing. It is not. If you give someone, if you give an adult daughter five hundred dollars a month for spending money, so that they can go out to to dinner, or that's not dependent. On the other hand, if you give them money to pay their rent, then it is dependent. So it's, um, it's, uh, so it's an expanded definition. It's really truly dependent for the basic necessities plus children plus spouse. Okay. Excuse me, can you define dependent? Sorry? Can you define dependent? I don't, well, I'll, we don't actually, the volume's not on. I'll go and stand over here then, all right? There's, um, we, the, this mic is recording it, so I'm happy to stand over here. Does that Okay, we'll see what technology will bring for us. Is there an age limit for the dependent child? Uh, no. The assumption is if they're a minor, they're a dependent child. But if they're, they could be 50 or 60 and still a dependent child. Sorry, no, no. If they're a child, they're a dependent. Okay. <laughs> they're still a, there's, it's an expanded definition of dependent. You start with people who are dependent on you and you then would add to that your partner and your children. So they're deemed dependents. You, you might be married to someone who's incredibly wealthy and manages all their own finances. They still make the definition of dependent. A dependent parent? A dependent parent? Yes, you could be a dependent. There, there could be a dependent parent. Yes. Well, right. but, well, then you don't have any of these problems, do you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, the answer is you would you 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 have the ability to have what you might call a discretionary dependent, but it can't be or or nominee. So you could nominate me if you were mad enough to do so. Um, uh, but it would then be up to the trustee to decide whether it would go to me or under your will. All right. So I've um, uh, and I've seen situations where the trustee, where it was a public fund. And the trustee had to decide between a, um, a, a wife who, an older wife who was receiving maintenance and had the care and control of the children and a new wife and the children. And, and so there's this juggling of they were quite happy for the money to be allocated for the benefit of the children, but they weren't happy to give it to the wife. Excuse me, Dave, could I just do a check? Is that sound better? Mm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what is the point of a will if it can be contested? <laughs> um, you can do what you like with your money when you've fulfilled your obligations. All right? Uh, not necessarily taking No, 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 no. Your, will, your wishes uh, are all... Is this microphone going to work if I walk? Yes, yes okay. Um, the, your wish, wishes are always taken into account. But are you entitled to be capricious and mean? Because if you want to be, why don't you give it away while you're alive? Because right? no, no one can contest what you've given away. It's only what you happen to leave. Sorry? And Centrelink. Well, okay, life has rules. Okay? It's like you've got to drive on the left. But just that we had a situation where there was five dependents, five equal shares. The judge gave more to one than to the other. Okay. The, way it, the, the, the rules are about to change, but the way it works is this is that the starting premise is that you have the freedom of benefaction. You have the ability to give everything that you've got to whoever you like in whatever way after you've fulfilled your obligations. You know, it's like, it's like you can't spend any money till you've paid your tax, okay? Same kind of deal. So you have obligations and there will be uh, obligations to all sorts of people. Now, um, so the, deal, the way it starts is this. I'm now sitting down to make my will. Who are my obligations to? Who do I need to consider when I draw this document? Is it my aged mother that I give money to? 
Is it my family? Is it my wife and children? Right? Sorry? What about your wishes? Not your obligations, your wishes. Well, yeah, but you can do what you like after you've fulfilled your obligations. Right? Well, I'm, you know, I, I, what well, sort of depends on what side of the fence you're on. Why have a will? Because your starting premise is, is that it's yours. Fulfill your obligations, give away the rest the way you want to. Okay? And I, I honestly think there's a fairness in that. Um, is it, I mean, I, I come across situations where, um, where there's been family violence over a long period of time and that's why there's no relationship between the parent and the child. Um, shouldn't there be something there for that kind of thing? There, there are, you don't know what the basis of the estrangement is. What annoys me, um, if I'm entitled to be annoyed, is where uh, the claimant has in fact wasted their life. So you've got five children, all of whom were given exactly the same opportunities that close to each other, and, and one of them has, got, has actually blown it. It doesn't matter what they've done. The, the, the answer is, I've got no money, I am in need. That's the one where I find the, uh, you know, I, I don't know that my moral obligation to look after a child like that is, yep. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the problem. Irene. You know, if I ask, sort of, have you observed what the, uh, what the court's attitude is nowadays to contesting? Is it sort of open, almost anyone gets something? Well, uh, we're, we're, in, we're in the process of making changes. Uh, um, now, uh, I do volunteer work for the Heart Foundation and I manage their bequest program for them and we get a significant number of challenges where the Heart Foundation is, um, is a beneficiary. And the policy that's been developed over time there is, is that we're absolutely delighted to see, but receive a bequest after you've given to everybody you should have given to before you put our name in the document, right? And we do that in part because we think our reputation is worth far more than a court fight. But there are a significant number of people who turn around and say uh, that, you know, and, and the other problem that we've got is that we can't fight because we don't know what the relationship is. They may be a bequester, um, it may be a surprise to us, but we don't know what facts go behind all of this. Um, about six years ago, they came along, until six years ago, sorry, we start again. This is law that started about 100 years ago in New Zealand, and the law was that spouses and children could contest a will. At some point, that got expanded to former spouses who were including who were receiving maintenance. Um, what now happens is that the rules have changed to the point where anyone who felt that mum, dad, the next door neighbour owed them a moral owed them a responsibility. It's taken moral out now. Owed them a responsibility to provide for them can now challenge a will. So I could have a go at your will on the basis that you had an obligation to provide for me. And what I know from practical experience is that even if I've got no claim, it's going to cost you a lot of money to make me go away. So lots of them settle when on a moral ground they ought not settle. Uh, so lots of them settle. Two weeks ago, or yeah, two weeks ago, the state government introduced new legislation in the succession and surrogacy bill that... Uh, implement some. <laughs> What's the name of that bill? It's the Succession and Surrogacy Amendment Bill of 2014, introduced on the 22nd of August. And it is intended to, let's leave, I haven't read the surrogacy bit, but I can tell you about the succession bit. It's intended to limit the number of, the classes of people who can make a claim and uh, I quite frankly think it goes too far. It will exclude adult children except those who are actually financially dependent. And it will effectively be now uh, spouses, former spouses. So if you, because um, you can't start a family court proceeding once the other party's died. Right? So, you, so it's a way of having a property settlement against the estate. So it's spouses, children, um, and that's uh, children who are either financially dependent on you or under the age of 18, un 
or 26 for a full-time student. So they've limited the class. Because on the Heart Foundation files, we've got neighbours who used to take you for a drive. We've got the carer at the aged care facility who came along and said, well, I did more than my job. I took them for drives on the weekend and I helped them with their financial records and I did all sorts of other things. So the aim is to limit the class. Um, there's also the ability to, if the legislation is passed in some time in the next seven sitting days, um, there is going to be the ability to contract out of your obligations. I'll give you a million dollars today if you promise not to challenge my will. All right? So I, I can see a real opportunity for parental pressure on children to be bought off. I, I, I can see, because there's no equality of bargaining power, um, but I, you know, I can see that it would work in some cases. I also think it could be heavily abused. I, I am in favour of limiting the classes of people. I'm not in favour of excluding adult children because you actually need to know why is it they're, what, I, what is it that's causing them to make a claim. And lots of the claims that I see are lack of relationships, uh, bullying, sexual assaults, all of reasons why there's no relationship between the child and the parent, and the parent is just continued by excluding them from their will. But it is about, it will change. I can tell you that the Bar Council think they've gone too far. The Law Institute, they think they've gone too far and they have gone much further than the recommendations of the Law Reform Commission, who were asked to investigate. Sure, yep. Um, we've talked about children, but is it possible to specifically exclude your brother, or sister, things like that in your will, simply say, you've always had the benefit of every other will, the will's always said I didn't need it, but you're not getting any of mine. Can you do that? Uh, you, they've got to create a, a why would you have a, responsibility, I can see the starting proposition would be, I don't have a responsibility to provide for my brother and sister. Is that the case? Well, every case is dependent on its facts, but if, for example, your sister was totally financially dependent on you for the last 20 years, lived in a house that you owned at subs subsidised rent, then and you exclude her from her will, I come along and say, there's a responsibility there. Right? Don't know how much it is, but in those circumstances, I can't say there's no responsibility. And they can't challenge the will? Uh, under the new rules, they would not be able to challenge the will, unless there was financial dependence. Okay? Yes? Over here? Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'd like to bring up the issue of the family violence again. If you're going, um, I think uh, you actually said we are going to change. It hasn't gone through state. It's a bill. It was a bill that was introduced in August, um, but there's only seven sitting days left before they rise for the election. So who knows what's going to happen in the next seven days? Ask, uh, ask the member for Frankston. <laughs> okay? Okay? Yep. Um, on, on the question of violence, um, you've got two situations here that it opens up for elder abuse, for el elderly people, and also for children, as you've said before, that have either been uh, sexually or physically abused in the family and been cut out. Yes. Um, what has been the discussion around protecting older people from elder abuse and also... Uh, el elder abuse in, in the sense of a will planning or...? A lot of pressure on younger um, siblings. I mean, children that may have access to mum and dad's checkbook <coughs> to make sure that they... There is another piece of legislation that's amending the laws in relation to powers of attorney. That is creating much stronger obligations on, on attorneys. But that legislation... Bigger pardon? Could you... Um, if I could just ask, what about Okay. Does that, does that answer your question? No, Okay. All right. No, no, there's, there's legislation um, that's changing the rules in relation to powers of attorney. They're about to change the form um, and it will make it easier for someone to seek a review of a power of, of, of what an attorney is doing. Uh, at the moment, there's 
unless you've appointed as an administrator by, the, by VCAT, there's no way, there's no easy way of someone vetting what you're doing as an attorney. Now I have seen, there's been a couple of interesting cases at VCAT where a, where a beneficiary under a will, which can you imagine uh, Mary is mum's attorney, Mary is mum's executor. And uh, Mary accounts beautifully for the role that she performs as an executor faultlessly, but refuses to account to the beneficiary for what Mary's done as an attorney. You know, and we've, we're not sure that everything is where it ought to be or the numbers don't look big enough or where's it all gone. There have been a couple of successful applications made to VCAT where one of the beneficiaries comes along and says, I'm not satisfied with the starting proposition for Mum's estate because I think there ought to be more there. And the answer is they've been required to provide the appropriate reports. Where it went from there, I don't know. Yes? So I guess so just talking of children, um, does this extend to donor children? Beg your pardon? When talking about children... Uh, you mean providing for a children? Donor children. <coughs> children of donors. Um, the, uh, I haven't read the surrogacy legislation, but I, I had to look about two years ago for a person who was a donor, sperm donor, uh, in circumstances where he knew the parents. And his question was, does that child have any claim on my estate? Answer is, according to the legislation, no, because the legislation under which the su surrogacy rules apply effectively says that the donor has no rights. Now, now having said that, um, I once acted for a street child, uh, a, a very pretty 16-year-old, and what had happened to her was that um, she had been born as a result of a one-night stand and had been put up for adoption. She had been adopted by a couple, the wife died, the wife was replaced. So there was a second wife. Second wife despised the child and the child got pushed out. She found her birth father, in a sense, and, and he died. He started to look after her, he acknowledged the parentage, he started to provide her with some rent money and, you know, and she made a claim on his estate. Now, on one view, there should be no responsibility because the law says the, the link's broken. But on another, can't you see that he brought her into the world? He caused her to be. It's got to come with some cost. And that's got to be more than filling out an adoption form. So, you know, I, you, there's arguments in both directions. If you, we're running a strict, strict legal argument, go away. You, uh, we settled. I don't know. We didn't get a great deal of money, but we settled. Um, uh, purely someone in need. The dad had a bucket load of money um, and we settled. But, you know, we, we was line baller whether we'd run it or not. We thought it was important enough to run without charging it. Right? Yeah. To wherever I'm up to. I don't remember where I'm up to, Irene. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yes. Given the definition of children, how does that definition apply to children that have been adopted by a couple? Oh, the definition of children includes adopted children. The answer is, is that the law replaces um, you. If you adopt children, the law makes the children that you adopt yours. Okay? Without going into it specifically. Gee whiz, topic two, who do I leave it to? Um, uh, blended families. Um, blended families are fascinating. Uh, the, the, what I find with blended families is you basically want what's yours to go back to yours. Um, it's, it's rare when I'm making a will for couples who have remarried with children from each of the relationships that they're happy to treat everybody together. The usual practice is, I really want you to be looked after, but I want to go back. Right? Uh, what you need to do is, um, the, the, in a sense, the best way to achieve that is to, in fact, have a contract that says, 
you know, you have a contract to make a will in a particular form, because I'm happy to leave everything to you because I want you to be properly looked after. But at the end of the day, I want mine to come back to mine. Um, it creates some interesting will issues, because normally the contract says, and I promise not to make a will in any other way if I haven't changed it before you die. Um, where that gets interesting is, is that the law says that if you die, your will gets revoked. So if you get married, your will is revoked except to the extent that you provided for the person you're marrying. Now, if you've done a will with, I'll say, wife number two, and wife number two dies and you find wife number three and four wildly in love, and you make a new will, oh, sorry, and you marry, you no longer have a will. So I've now amended my templates to say that, and I promise to make a new will if I marry again, that says the same thing. But you have to think about how you're going to provide for blended families. Because we have a law in a, well, in New South Wales, there's a, a clause that says, we'll count as part of your notional estate everything you've given away in the last five years for less than full value. Because one of the ways to defeat a clause like that is to in fact give it away. All right, put it in a trust and park, you know, the trust then falls away, doesn't form part of your estate. New South Wales deals with the problem. It was a recommendation from the Law Reform Commission that it be included here, but never was. You know? So, you know, blended families are an issue. Uh, fractured families are an issue. It's the testator's family maintenance claims. It's the part four <coughs> claims. Uh, dealing with a fractured family. Um, you know, I've, I've acted for a couple of grumpy old men who've decided that they didn't like any of their children. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and you know, some of them contested and some of them did not. Uh, but, you, but I would have come along and said, if you've got three needy children all in housing commission and you leave everything to the floory, then I, they're going to challenge, all right? And then it becomes the, the charity's difficulty. How, how, do, how, do I, um, you know, how do I accommodate what is clearly a need situation? Um, I suppose at this stage we then say, and if you've got any spare, you could consider giving them to a charity. What we have here is a, we live in an, in an environment where um, generosity appears to be something that belongs to the older generation and not the new. Um, uh, I, I look at, the, I've, I'm involved with a couple of charities and there is some, there is some money out there, but it, the, while the level of bequests doesn't appear to have dropped generally, I think it hasn't dropped because the value of the underlying assets have, ris have risen, not because there are more people giving, there are fewer people giving. And so it's a, you know, it's a sort of a false, you know, I look at some of uh, what some of the charities are getting and, and they seem to be maintaining dollar levels in terms of bequests, but they're getting it from fewer people. So one of the things that I've now started to do is talk to people when they're making a will. I say, look, you've got your obligations to provide, but if your children are okay, and you might look at considering some grandchildren, but you might also then consider whether it's appropriate to spread the dollars so that there's a community benefit, not just the family. Now, how do I leave it to them? Uh, if you've got a financial planner, they've undoubtedly talked to you about a testamentary trust. If you haven't, lucky you. Huh? <laughs> um, uh, a, a, a testamentary trust is, it's, it's sold, uh, on a number of grounds. Uh, a testamentary trust is effectively the old style business discretionary trust, but buried in a will. Buried, what, in, buried in a will, all right? And what it does is that it, um, it puts someone in control of the trust and says, but the income can be distributed amongst people who match this definition. And so the definition might be uh, one of my descendants or one of my grandfather's descendants, because I might want to look after my brothers and sisters and my nieces and nephews. So I'm the central person in the trust. The eligible beneficiaries are my grandfather's dependents or anyone who is a partner or spouse of those people. I'm then able to distribute income. Its benefits are uh, husband and wife distributions or husband and or, you know, partner distributions and distributions to grandchildren. If you're paying private school fees, it's a much better way to do it. If you're making a distribution from a lifetime trust or distributing income, unearned income for minors, 
is about $408 and then it starts attracting penalty uh, tax rates. Distributions on unearned income to minors in a testamentary trust are taxed, are taxed the same way that we are. So the first $18,000 is tax free. And depending on where you go to school, that either pays the school fees or it goes close. Right? So that, that's the main. Um, the next reason you sell it is that, uh, or the financial planners sell it, is that they think it will have the benefit of protecting assets from the family court. Doesn't. The Family Law Act basically says that a judge can tell anyone to do anything. So if I set up a trust for your benefit, in a testamentary trust for your benefit, I die, the person who's leaving the money, it, if it's got your name on it and it's wrapped around you, then the family court will treat it like it's yours. And it doesn't matter who the trustee is, they'll direct the trustee how to exercise the power or discretion. So um, it's an interesting tax planning exercise. I like it because I charge a lot more for it than I do for a normal will. <laughs> uh, but I spend an awful lot of time really trying to find out from the client whether that's what they need. If you're 50, probably not because your children are at the point where they need their money to pay off their mortgage. If you're 70 and your children are better established, maybe. But um, it's more, a, more for the benefit of, uh, of financial planners than anybody else because it's a separate client. Um, most people still leave their estate, what I'll call a bog standard will, I leave everything to my wife and if my wife has predeceased me, I leave it to my children. And that's what 90% of us do. Uh, you might consider whether you would like to skip a generation. Do you want to provide directly for grandchildren? I had one lady, I've got one will that came in uh, last, well, one estate that came in last week. Two daughters, a third to one, a third to the other. A third to one, one daughter, a third to the other daughter and a third distributed equally between the grandchildren. Uh, I thought that was an interesting way of ensuring that everybody got something. The, each of the grandchildren will get $200,000. They're all in their early 20s. I thought it was a really nice thing. But mind you, they had to wait a long time. She was 94 when she died. <laughs> um, life interests. Uh, life interests are interesting. It's where I give you the ownership of an asset until you die. Um, some people like to say you can have the house, but when you die, you've got to give it to X. I don't see that as enforceable. Um, so what you might do, what the law allows you to do is give you, I'm going to give you the house to, your, to you for life and upon your death it passes there. So you never own all of it, you just own the bit while you're alive. Um, and I had, uh, my, my first issue is, does the life interest provide adequately for the person who has, who's going to be left behind? Now, um, I had a farmer come to see me a week ago who now knows that he's got an incurable cancer. He has maybe three years to live. He has a child under the age of 10 and he has a wife who he quite likes, but... You know, <laughs> and what he wants to do, and he's, he's got it worth about three, million, three or four million dollars, but it's all tied up in a farm. And we all know that, in, that the only way you can make money out of a farm is to actually work it. Share farming you don't get a great return. So his difficulty is how does he provide for his wife when what he really wants is the farm left for the child? And so his starting proposition, well, I'll give the, I'll give the wife a life interest. And I said, well, that'll work perfectly. But you do realise that under the Settled Land Act, she has the power of sale. So she can force a sale of the property, which would in fact defeat everything that he wanted because he knows that once, he gets, once the land gets sold, he'll never be able to buy it back or anything like that. Um, so his, my problem with him is that, is that he's not dealing appropriately with his obligations to his partner. And he's trying to plan 30 years or 20 years out for a 10-year-old. Um, but his biggest problem is going to be... So I've, I've, the, what I've suggested to him is that um, he gives 90% or 80% of the income from the trust. We put it in a testamentary trust, the thing I told you not to do. Um, put it in a testamentary trust. Make her one of the trustees and choose two other trustees who are 
who are young enough to be around until the child gets to 25 and have an interest in the farming life. Uh, and there's no point of pointing me because I just sell it. Um, and then come up with an income sharing arrangement whereby she gets the vast majority of the income until such time as she dies. And he said, oh, I don't know, I want that. Uh, but, uh, but what was quite strange was that 20 minutes before he was prepared to give her a life interest which gave her 100% of the income. Mm. So uh, it's uh, quite often the discussions are about teasing out uh, you know, what alternatives we might put in place. Yes? No, but uh, how would a mix between uh, leaving the state to uh, able children and one of them is mentally disabled, would that mix in like that? Or? Oh, you could set up a trust, you could put a share of the trust, sorry, you could put a share of the estate in a trust for a particular child. Um, disabled children are a problem. Because if state trustees find out what you've done, they will challenge your will. All right? Um, well, well, why? Because, why? Because, because remember we talked about your moral responsibility to your, to your children? Um, the state is not the primary provider of services. All right? So um, uh, th there's a couple, of things, a couple of things you can do about it. Um, and, and you see them... I mean. Every now and then you'll structure an arrangement so that the Centrelink benefit for the child can be maintained. Um, so I'll give you a, a couple of scenarios. Let's say, for example, um, that we have uh, a, an estate where there are four children, one of whom is under a disability, might be severely retarded and is just simply in state care. Now, um, I've seen an estate where that child got nothing, right? and they were relying upon the three able-bodied children to look after the disabled child. Now, l let's assume that in fact the three do. Let's assume everybody behaves exactly as expected. What you've done is, is you've, shipped it, you've shifted all the real responsibility for looking after the child onto the state. Right? There's an asset and you know, we, the numbers are now getting bigger. The states of $2 million are actually quite common. You've now come along and you've said, well, I'm going to give each of my beneficiaries $666,000 rather than five hundred. So um, I suppose if nobody tells the if nobody tells anybody, that's okay. I've seen a couple of those go through. But I have also seen a situation where the disabled child was significantly underprovided for, uh, where the estate where the will has been challenged because mum and dad have an obligation to the child to look after the child that they brought into the world and um, in which case, and we know what the care costs are going to be, so a significantly greater chunk of the estate went to uh, the court fund for the care and maintenance of the child. Okay, so yeah, quite possible to do. It's, it's, you're sort of between a rock and a hard place. If you set up the fund, you've actually told them they get to find out about it. If you don't set up the fund, they may never know. And the six months may pass and nobody challenges the will, so we're cool. So, it, you know, look, it really is quite hard. Uh, and I, I had a client who died last year who left, um, who has a um, schizophrenic son and two children who are not. And uh, what they've done is they've put some money aside to look after the son and the two other two get to look after it. But, but you know, you have to turn around and say, look, I, I happen to know both of them and I'm, I'm more than satisfied that even if, that I'm satisfied they both are going to look after him. And if one of them doesn't, I'm quite sure that the other one will just shrug and pick up the tab. But you also wonder whether you mightn't have provided for that child in a different way. Instance. In that particular instance, if you put the estate into a testamentary trust with the two sons um, in charge of the trust, uh, two appointors, yes. um, what would be your objection to that? Or what would I, I don't have any objection. You tell me what you want me to write down and I'll write it down. Yeah. What would be, you know, what would be the complexity? Would that be the, the answer is, is that there is no obligation to provide for the disabled child. So if I'm 
if I'm representing the interest of the disabled child, tell me how you're going to run it. Well, it means, okay, if the disabled child challenges it, but when you have two sons, a, a close family where you, you know, you assume that they will look after the disabled child, is that not a... I'm now acting for the disabled child. I can't afford to make that assumption. You, you might. You might say, no, we're fine. We're in this together. But I, how can I be sure that's what you're going to do? So you're obliged to give it to a state authority? <sighs> no, no, you can set up the test, the trust. There is no difficulty. The question become, the question arises when there's an obligation to provide income to the child. So what you might do is set it up in some kind of discretionary trust where you, in fact, you accumulate the income, you pay tax at a higher rate than you otherwise would have, but you're not then dealing with the state authorities. Okay? I'll just add something special disability trust. Yes, you can set up a special disability trust. Yep. And that is special for their care. Yeah, absolutely. And they work, they work really well. It's just a question of what proportion... But the moment you set up the special disability trust, which is great, but let's assume you've got an estate worth $5 million and you put 200000 in the special disability trust. Someone sticks up their hand and says, well, it's not enough. I now want you to put a million and a half into the trust. All right? That's when the problem starts to arise. Not, not with what you're doing, but with the comparative size of what you're doing. Sorry? Um, I've got a special disability trust for my adult disabled daughter and I believe under the terms of the disability trust you can only have one trust in the will. Um, is a foundation a trust? If I add a foundation into it, is that classified as a trust? Well, you can only have one special disability trust but yeah. there's no reason why you couldn't have another trust that isn't a special disability trust and you can call it what you like. Okay. Right. Right? I mean, they used to be called settlements. Right, but you can call it a foundation if you want to, or you can call it a trust. Yes. The, the case that you just talked about with the farmer, yes, uh, who wanted to leave his farm to his son, to his ten-year-old son, yes, wanted to provide for. No, I'm not sure that he wanted to. I told him he had an obligation to provide for his wife. Yep. I don't hear very well, so I, I thought you'd said something like. But you could deal with that by putting the assets into a testamentary trust. Is that what you said? No, what I was trying to deal with was that if I gave the, life, the wife a full life interest, she would have a power of sale and be able to sell the farm, which is the last thing that he wanted to happen. So you, what you would do in that case, and only with her agreement, is that you would set up a testamentary trust that guaranteed her a minimum proportion of the income for an agreed period of time, which might be her lifetime. Thank you. Okay? And then the, the mother and the, and the son could, in fact, in 15 years' time, when the child hits 25, strike a deal and wind it up. Okay? If he didn't want to be a farmer, there was no point keeping the farm. Uh, my, sorry, Irene. Oh, you sure, sure. I promise not to take any longer. All right? Um, <laughs> My question then, what I want to talk to you then about is, is managing the process. Um, I've, I've, in the last five years I've changed, the first thing you need to do is think about who your executors are going to be. Well actually I think that's the last thing you do because that's the person who is going to manage the process. I used to write wills that said I leave everything to my wife Marie and I make her the executor and if she doesn't survive me I leave everything to my children and I make the oldest one the executor. Um, uh, I'm seeing more and more cases of dementia, uh, more and more um, Alzheimer type cases. So I've now changed the will and it now says I make my, my, my wife Marie to be my executor but if she's unwilling or unable to act then I appoint my daughter. All right. Now I leave everything to my wife and then if she doesn't survive me then I leave everything to my children. So that's the model that I now follow. You need to work out who that person is going to be. You need to work out uh, whether it's a blended family because who am I going to give the job to, one from each side. Um, we, we recently had one where uh, we, we rendered the process unnecessary, a blended marriage, blended family. 
And the agreement that the husband and wife reached was that, well, they came into the marriage, he, she had a house and he had cash. And we, what we agreed was that when, one of, when he died, um, she was to receive $250,000 uh, and the rest of it was to go to his family. So the answer was, let's remove the friction between his side and her side. And we, what we, where we resolved the issue was that we set up a joint account in term deposits that had $250,000 in it and we put a clause in the will that says she gets $250,000 less what's in this joint account or whatever we've got in term deposits in joint names. And the instant he died, the financial interdependence stopped and we were able to administer the estate um, in circumstances where there was no pressure either way. We provided for financial independence in the widow and we provided for the, for the husband's estate to be administered completely independently of whatever it was that the, uh, that the widow wanted, needed or sought. So uh, there's a way that you can, you can resolve that. Um, executors, my choices are these. The people who are going to benefit under the will, for me, is the first choice. Second choice is people who really care for the people who are going to benefit under the will. So if you're giving it all to your grandchildren, there's no reason why you couldn't make your children the executors. Because they, if there's anyone they care about almost as much as themselves, it's going to be their children. All right? Uncles and aunts and cousins, I'm not sure about, but your own children probably. Okay? Uh, my third choice is a trusted advisor, which might be a lawyer or an accountant or just a trusted advisor. Um, preferably someone who's got professional indemnity insurance and fiduciary insurance. Um, <laughs> and if they don't, please make sure that they do. And my last choice is trustee companies. And there's a place for trustee companies. Um, I find them to be large and impersonal, but if you're looking to set up a fund for the benefit of your great-grandchildren, you can rest assured that the trustee company will be around then. So they're my choices. You clearly have to pay the last two, professional advisor or a, um, or a trustee company. You can negotiate the fees. Um, what you really want, whoever you get to administer your estate, you need to be confident they're going to do it the way you want. So, when I get the job, my first question is, can you give me the information I need to fill out the death certificate, please? Uh, because I've had a couple of estates where I've been appointed as the executor and had absolutely nothing to go on. So, um, I, need you, I need your mum and dad, I need to know when you arrived in Australia, I need, need to know who you were married to and when, I need to know how the marriage ended, I need to know the names of your children, and the doctor fills out the rest of it, okay? Um, then I need to know what your funeral arrangements are. What have you got planned? I have one very nice lady who's actually mapped out the path for her sister to take from the church to the cemetery. <laughs> okay? And what pieces of music are to be played at what point in the service? Um, if you want to be cremated, what do I do with the ashes? Where am I going to put them? Who do I give them to? Where do I scatter them? Um, if you're going to be buried, who's got the burial right? Who do I need to ask for you to go there? Um, then I ask for a head start. Where do you bank? Who's your accountant? What's your tax file number? Um, are you in a super fund? Who is it? And now I'm not asking, I never ask people to update that information, but it's an awfully good start when the time comes. Because right? you can normally track forward. Um, and the other thing I do is put in a mail redirection for a year because you'll catch most things at that time. What I haven't yet worked out at is, is how to close down your online existence. <laughs> okay? Uh, how do I deal with your Facebook account? The Twitter feeds and the 400 followers that you've got, right? Um, uh, LinkedIn, I haven't worked out how to do that. I also need some way of, um, what do I do with your emails? Yeah. Right? The, all of those sorts of things in this day and age we need to think through. I'm not satisfied I've got the answers on those questions, but they need to be, they need to be sorted out. The, the tricky one I was thinking about, David, is that so many of us now have online financial environments, whether it's a, um, a PayPal account that might have a balance in it or something. And, 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 uh, I'll never find it. If you don't tell me it's there, I will never find it. Well, uh, tax. For those of you who've got assets, it's important that 
um, particularly people who've got investment properties or they've got a share portfolio, someone has to have the information to prepare the capital gains tax paperwork. Now, we've had capital gains tax now for 29 years. Well, 29 years in two weeks' time. Uh, and there are very few assets that are now not subject to capital gains tax in some form. If I'm your executor and I'm selling the investment property that you've got, how do I know what it costs you? So you need to have the records accessible that says there's the paperwork as to what it cost me. I had a renovation. There's the paperwork as to what the renovation is. Um, so you need to have that paperwork available and it needs to be kept in a, in a place where, where it's accessible. So um, otherwise your estate's going to end up paying some more tax. So if, you've, if you bought a house in 1990 as an investment property, you're now selling it, you're making a notional profit of $300,000, but I don't know how much you paid for the extension that you put on in 2000. I can't do anything with it. I can, I'm stuck with the stamp duty that was paid on the transfer at the time you, at the time you completed the purchase. So please make sure your paperwork's right. Yep. Any tips on how to find out the pre-September 89 share prices? Pre, Pre-September 85 share prices? When it, came in. it came in on the 19th of September 1985. 85. A fateful day. Yep. Any tips on how to track down share prices pre that date? You don't care about pre that date. Well, you've got to prove it though, haven't you? No, you can prove you had it that long. Can you not prove you had it that long? No, there's no paperwork. Uh, then for $175 a share, you can actually uh, go back to the share registry and they'll give you a transaction history. All right? And we've had to do that on any number of occasions. It's still cheap. Uh, while I resent the money, it's still cheaper paying them than the tax office. Okay? And my last topic is what if I falter first? Um, as we get older and uh, the quality of these people keep us alive longer, um, <laughs> We're not always as good as we always, we, you know. I have a friend who used to say he was good in his day. Um, so you need to think about powers of attorney. You need to think about who you're going to give the powers to. You need to think about who you're going to give the power of attorney to if they falter. A lovely couple came in and she'd given a power of attorney to her husband. Unfortunately, she was no longer capable of making a new one and he had dementia, okay? So you need to take the next step and say, who do I give the power to if they can't? Now, is there a difference between power of attorney and medical power of attorney? Yeah, they have the, yeah, well, it's subject to what they do in the, new, in the next seven days, who knows. Uh, but there is, there's a general power of attorney which is, deals with non-health matters and it ceases um, when you become incapable of managing your own affairs. There's an enduring power of attorney that continues to operate when you become, where, for while you are incapable, and it it arises, it it may only arise when you become incapable, um, uh, and it can again it could finish at any any time. A medical power of attorney deals with health issues, and if you're going to have a medical power of attorney, can I also suggest that you fill out an advanced healthcare directive? Um, I used to work on three UZ, so I call them writing instructions. Um, <laughs> It, it's the, the, the attorney or the agent under the enduring power of attorney makes the decision, but they may, it may need to feel that they're making the right decision and they may need to persuade others that they've made the right decision. If you fill out an advanced health care directive, then the person who is making the decision using the medical power of attorney can feel confident that they're implementing your wishes. All right? So while... The uh, medical treatment power of attorney is a standalone document. I would be recommending, and I recommend to my clients, that they have an advanced health care directive so that, that whoever gets the job knows whatever it is that they need to do. Um, An organisation called Dying with Dignity Victoria. Yep. And we have tremendous assistance there. Uh, yes. On the phone book uh, and well worth giving a ring. I'm, I'm a passionate Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I look, can I say I agree? Um, I've, I've visited their website. Uh, there's lots of helpful information. But I do think if you've got the directive, that's great. Um, uh, I, I can say that we, a small part of my practice over the last 15 years, because I tend to think that I'm now at the point in my life where my, um, 
my client base represents the same demographic as the ABC listeners, um, <laughs> uh, is that uh, we've got at any one time about a dozen people who, are, who have no one else and their choice is between my firm and a trustee company and we do things like we pay their bills, we visit them in aged care, we provide them with financial reports, we send people along to doctor's appointments. So they, they tend to be people who've got no one else because I honestly think those kinds of things are best done by family. Now, is that it? One last question? Oh. Oh, we've got two minutes to go, have we? Okay. Yes. I would just say single people are often in that category but we're not quite at that stage too. Relatives are not necessarily... No, I, I, I agree. Um, m most of the people... Well, sorry. I have one client who has dementia and is in care and she has a second partner and she has children who hate the second partner, okay? My job's to sit in the middle. They're both happy to deal with me. But the aged care facility is happier to deal with me than with either of those. And so I'm, my job there is to maintain the peace. Um, I've got another one who's a really nice lady. She's 96. Um, and she's, her sister died 18 months ago and she was no longer prepared to live at home. So we moved her to aged care. We've sold her house. Her closest relative is a niece and a nephew in New Zealand. So we arrange for her to be taken out every week. So she goes shopping. It doesn't buy anything, but you know, she goes shopping. They go out for coffee, they go to a movie, they try restaurants. Um, and we, one of the things that we do is we're able to negotiate with the aged care facility so they know somebody cares. It's not just a check in the mail, uh, which is what I'm afraid they often get with a trustee company. So it, it's um, uh, and we we talk to the to the niece and nephew in New Zealand about once a fortnight, and it's their way of knowing that that auntie's being being looked after. Uh, and we had one gentleman who came to me from St Vincent's Hospital. He was a uh, a, a vet who had burnt all of his bridges with his family many years before. And he, same, same situation, wasn't well enough to go home. So it was a question of let's move him into care, let's sell his house, let's manage his affairs. Uh, and he lived in a, you know, he died earlier this year. Quite yes, the, the, I mean the, the, the inability to cope to, to com, comes across, across people very quickly. Yep. Yep. If I leave my assets to both of my children equally, yes. In a testamentary trust, oh, I would do two testamentary trusts. Because if you do one testamentary trust, what you're actually saying is you two have to manage this together forever. You're all but guaranteeing that it will fall apart because your children will have different aims and objectives in life. So you would say in your will you would create two testamentary trusts with half the assets in one and half the assets in other. Uh, if you, uh, the trustee act says that there's a trust for land. If you're going to appoint new trustees, there needs to be two. But you can start with one. So you could make the trustees um, uh, your two children, uh, of your, your executors could, could be your two children, and you could set up a trust with one as the controller and a trust with the other as the controller. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Oh. Um, I suppose the questions that we need to ask are, uh, what do I have? Who do I leave it to? How do I leave it to them? Who, who manages the...